Yeah, thanks, Frank, for the introduction. And um, yeah, just really excited to be here. Happy to get out of the house. I think all of us have probably been inside for way too long. And um, yeah, I'm here to talk about a little bit about uh, motion planning, which is where uh, my expertise is. I, I was at Rice University for a long time until very recently, actually. Uh, and um, a lot of the work that I did in motion planning, now that I'm working for a company, uh, we're thinking about how that uh, will enable uh, future autonomous systems, like how we can use that power of motion planning to make systems that are more usable for people that are not robotics experts. Um, so most of you probably haven't heard of Picnic uh, before. Uh, so we are a small company based in Boulder, uh, focused on robotic software. So we have a lot of robotics PhDs and robotic masters. And even though my area is, motion, is in motion planning, you know, we basically try to cover everything in robotics. So we have lots of people in control, perception, and, and everything else, and navigation that, uh, that you might think of as robotics related. And we work with, uh, together with many other companies that are typically more focused on the hardware development. And together we sort of work on making systems that uh, are functional in, in the real world. Uh, and that, what does it mean? Uh, of course, we work on sort of warehouse robots where you will find lots of robots. But uh, typically, we uh, work more on projects that are not as well established, like not working robots that are 5% faster than the competition, but more like develop robot systems that there really isn't a really a good um, sort of basis for comparison. So we've worked on you know, kitchen robots, which is really you know, a lot of kitchen robots companies now, and ghost kitchens, but also in home kitchens. Um, you know, agriculture, fruit picking robots, you know, manipulating fruit is really hard. There's lots of perception challenges and control challenges and construction. Uh, you see more and more robots. And uh, lately also in space, there's a, you know, uh, we work with NASA, but there's also increasing interest from commercial space companies and what to do with robots in space. Uh, so we're happy to work with uh, all of these companies. Um, so starting with, with space, uh, this is a, sort of a motivating example to set sort of the stage for um, what I'm going to talk about next. So this is some, some of the earlier work that I did at RICE, and actually some of the, a lot of the results that I'm presenting today are based on work I did at RICE. Uh, this is joint work with NASA where we see a humanoid robot performing a sort of routine task in the one-to-one in, in -one scale model in the International Space Station. So the goal is to fetch a bag out of storage over there, it's been marked with the April tags. In the process, in the, to do so, it has to walk across rails, open a door, take a few more steps, and grab this bag. Uh, so this, you know, you can see the video is speed up quite a bit, and it's, you know, it takes a long time to actually do this, which is actually okay. Uh, typically, this is something that we want mission control to do, and if they were able to completely autonomously script this event, and it doesn't matter if, it, uh, if it's slow or not. There's an, an, uh, it, it is not like, um, it, it really is, uh, the goal is to alleviate work from the, the, the astronauts. And, but the problem is that this cannot be fully autonomous. We cannot plan over that long a time horizon. Right? There's most of the individual steps, we can be reasonably sure that they work, but the chance that all of it works and can be planned end to end just doesn't happen. Right? And that's where we need some combination of autonomous planning and some, and some human involvement to make this possible. So I'll start with the motion planning, and towards the end, I'll describe our sort of plan for uh, make this more autonomous with some human, uh, human in a loop. So let's start from the very basics. Um, so motion planning really is a very b simple problem. You think it would be solved by now, and Seth and I were just talking about this. Isn't this solved by now? Like why, why are we still thinking about this? Uh, it's the problem of just getting from A to B without colliding with anything and while respecting kinematic and dynamics constraints. Um, so some early results show that, you know, mostly bad news that, yes, this problem can be solved, but in essentially exponential time. Right? Any reasonable version of this problem is P-space P space complete or worse. So we're a non-computer scientist in the room. It just means that there's no uh, known polynomial algorithm that can solve this efficiently. You know, as the number of dimensions uh, grows, of your robot, the number of degrees of freedom grows, this pro problem gets very, very bad. And if you introduce interesting dynamics for some notion of interesting, it becomes really hard to even determine whether a solution exists. So this is the bad news. Uh, luckily, uh, there are practical ways to, to deal with this, as I'll talk about later. So 
like I mentioned, the complexity is usually characterized in a number of uh, degrees of freedom, like the number of joints that you may have. Uh, but constraints and dynamics usually add some uh, other notions of complexity, like whether, um, you know, if you have, obviously if you have second order dynamics, then suddenly your state space grows uh, quite a bit and you have more dimensions to reason about. Of course, that makes planning more difficult. And the longer your time horizon is, will also affect the difficulty. And whether there's any uncertainty in perception or which really is not technically part of the challenging, uh, the, the planning problem. But as soon as you start doing planning in, in the real world, you have to account for perception of uncertainty, model uncertainty, and actuation uncertainty that will determine whether you can actually execute your plan or whether it makes sense to plan over longer time horizons. Uh, so over time, uh, different planning approaches can, have come up. This is my rough taxonomy of uh, approaches that exist today. So I have been working mostly in sampling-based planning. I'll give a brief view of that, but then there's Lots of other approaches like heuristic search methods where we try to have a lattice of our continuous space and we search this lattice and we, you know, we can efficiently search this and guarantee some notion of optimality with respect to some cost function. Uh, and of course, uh, optimization-based methods exist. Those would be very popular too. And if you initialize your initial trajectories randomly or in some way that you can still guarantee completeness, but typically they tend to be more uh, local methods. And then, of course, there are control theoretic approaches that uh, have been also very successful, but again, over sort of more smaller time horizons. Uh, so within sampling-based planning, which I'll define and explain later, you can still account for dynamics. We have these kinodynamic planning versions of it, and we have, can still account for optimality, and there are even combinations that try to do both. Um, so yeah, there's uh, a lot of work in this area and trying to come up with different kind of performance guarantees and different kind of theoretical guarantees for these algorithms. And I'll try to give you a flavor of that later on. Uh, so yeah, first, uh, a little bit of background to help understand the rest of the talk is a brief introduction to sampling-based planning. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about constrained motion planning because the way that we do motion planning in the real world typically involves some task constraints. It's rare that we just move around in free space without having to worry about any constraints at all. Uh, then I'll talk about a really practical problem that actually is kind of a big issue, is that there's all these different planning algorithms and whenever you have a clever idea about a new planner, it's not really clear like what you should be comparing against and how you do, uh, or in any, as a, as a practitioner, practitioner, like how you even select the right planner for your problem of interest. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that later. There's, there's a lot of work to be done actually in sort of figuring out what makes, what's the right planner for the job. And from there on, we can then switch to supervised autonomy and how we can combine these planning as a building block to build something that is uh, more functional for uh, an, a fully autonomous system with some human oversight. All right, um, sampling-based planning is actually really simple and the, the, the fact that it's as so simple is that there's a lot of a few operations that can be done very efficiently, and even though it doesn't seem particularly clever, but the fact that we can do these operations very efficiently means that we can do them millions of times and we can actually plan very fast. Uh, so the key idea is to understand configuration space. This is a very old idea. So let's say we have a two degree of freedom arm, the simplest possible arm. There's a joint here, there's a joint there, and it's a circular obstacle. And we can basically plot then the configurations over here in the right where every point represents a robot configuration and uh, we mark configuration as in, in collision when it collides with this circle and uh, white if it's not in collision. So you get this really weird shape and it's not completely intuitive how a robot and the geometry of the environment maps to this shape. Uh, but this is the most convenient space to plan in. So if you want to find a path from A to B, uh, it looks like there is no path because there's an obstacle in between but if we allow the arm to wrap around, so there's also you know, interesting topology, essentially we can go from A to B by just sort of falling off the map here and, well, or sort of go here and then come back here and then wrap, wrap around that way, right? The angles could wrap around. Um, the main point is that even though computing this shape is difficult, uh, generating random configurations is easy, just throwing points at the map, right? That's easy. And checking whether a configuration is in collision is also easy. I mean, we basically have to figure out whether two rectangles intersect with a, uh, a circle or not. 
also pretty easy. And uh, connecting configurations to nearby configurations, since you're just doing linear interpolation in angle space, it's also easy. So there's a number of operations that we need. I'm kind of skipping over a lot of details, but just sampling configurations, checking whether they're valid and connecting them, they're all reasonably simple operations. And we can combine these operations now to do actual planning. Uh, just to give you another data point of like why this might be a good idea, uh, so this is a similar robot. Now it has three degrees of freedom. It's seen from the side, with sort of planar manipulator, uh, seen from the top, and there's one cylindrical obstacle. Really simple, like the most minimal scene that you can think of. And this is already kind of the complexity of the kind of what this cylinder might look like in configuration space. So it's very non-intuitive. It's you don't want to compute this shape. And in fact, the algebraic, algebraic uh, complexity of this geometric object is what makes motion planning so hard. Right? This computational complexity of this shape is what makes motion planning hard. So essentially, for an optimal path, you'd be touching these boundaries a lot. So you kind of need to know the boundary. So we kind of are going to bypass that optimality for now. I'll come back to that later. And just say, let's just compute a feasible path and not worry about computing this shape exactly. We don't necessarily want to sort of trace out the boundary. Uh, so we can sample efficiently, construct a graph where configurations are connected to ones that are, uh, can be connected with straight line interpolation. And this graph structure can be represented very compactly, right? unlike this really complex, weird shape in high dimensions. So what might this look like in, in 2D? So again, imagine that we have a 2D uh, Two joint robot, and we have each dot represents a robot configuration. Let's say we start here, we want to go there. Uh, so we could sample and construct a tree while we go along. So each time we, we select a node in our tree and randomly extrapolate from it towards the great unknown right? and keep growing a tree that way. And every once in a while, what we might do is try to find a node in a tree and connect it straight to the goal. Let's do joint interpolation and check along the way, are we colliding with anything or not? In this case, it fails. And then we just keep going and keep growing our tree, expanding everywhere. And there are lots of different heuristics to, to do this. I mean, one technique is just to sample uniformly everywhere in this space and then find the nearest node in the tree and then grow from that nearest node in the tree towards that random sample. Uh, but there's lots of other heuristics. There's, you know, there, this, yeah, for a while there were just Every robotics conference has like 10 new ways to do sampling most, uh, motion planning. And you still see new, new papers every once in a while for slightly different problem settings, on, depending on what kind of theoretical guarantees you care about. Uh, so this showing just one tree. In many cases, it's more efficient to grow two, two trees, one from start to goal and one from goal to start. And every once in a while, try to connect these trees. And you can just grow a graph. It doesn't have to be a tree. You can just basically try to connect every new node in your tree to every k nearest neighbors. Just do a, there's efficient data structures for finding nearest neighbors in, in space, and we can just construct a, a graph if you want. And the graph has the advantage that basically it's useful. It's a, it's a reusable object. It's a, if your start and goal keep changing, then you can reuse the same graph over and over again. Um, so this is this 2D example, and I kind of pretend that we know where these obstacles are. But uh, what the point of the sampling based planning is that we, in general, we don't know what they are. And in higher dimensions, we, we typically try to not compute that at all. So all we are doing is we don't, we don't know where these obstacles are at all. We don't know the shape. We just sample. And every once in a while, we we'll sample bad samples. We throw them away with these axes. And we keep the good samples only and keep growing our tree that way. But we don't need to know anything about topology necessarily. Right? We don't need to know anything about the shape of the obstacles. Uh, all of that is left implicit, and that's all fine. Right? All we, we're doing is just sampling points and have some notion of distance and some notion of interpolation, and that's all. That's all we need. Right? So it really doesn't matter if you're planning in a Klein bottle or a torus or you know, regular Euclidean space. Uh, Sampling-based planning will just work. Um, so yeah, I already kind of alluded to this, like how we connect samples is basically you find two samples that are somewhat nearby, and compute a straight line path in configuration space, and we just interpolate at some resolution and keep doing collision checks. And there are fancier ways to do collision checking where we actually have continuous collision checking that 
automatically determine the step size, but the simplest way is to check at some resolution. And if all checks succeed, then you say there's a valid way to go from A to B, and you keep that edge. Um, so despite the randomness, we can still give some theoretical guarantees. Uh, so the one thing that we cannot do is determine whether a path exists or not. Oh, sorry, whether uh, uh, a path does not exist. So it's semi-decidable. If a path exists, we will eventually find it. But if it doesn't exist, we won't know for sure. Because you can keep sampling and keep going forever without knowing for, for, uh, for sure. But if it does exist, uh, the good news is that we will find it uh, with probability one, often at an uh, exponential rate, where basically as, the, as time goes on, the probability of not finding it goes to zero exponentially fast. And here's a sort of intuition for that. So let's say we have a path that goes from A to B, and we know, that, and let's say there exists a path that clears R from obstacles. So somewhere along the, this path, we are like a distance R away from obstacles. So we can use that to sort of essentially tile the path with little disks or spheres in, high, in the higher dimensions of the radius R. And inside that, each sphere, we can make smaller spheres of size R over two, spaced apart at distance R over two. That means that from any ball, we can connect to any other point in that ball. So as we keep sampling, eventually we get sort of samples inside each of these balls. So the probability that basically one of these balls will remain empty as we keep sampling more and more goes to zero really quickly. And so it's just a, so there's a non-zero, uh, yeah, a, a, a finite probability of finding a, a hit in each ball. And as, as time goes on, we basically, the probability of not hitting any, uh, all of these balls goes to zero very quickly. So that's a really quick intuition for it. There's more details to the proof. And this is you know, proven a long time ago by Lydia Kavraki. Um, and this is the notion of probabilistic completeness. It is very different from the traditional completeness and also different from resolution completeness. So with grid-based search, like A star and, and, and variance, we decide some resolution beforehand, and we have to kind of decide what the resolution should be for you know, shoulder joint versus wrist joint, or you know, however you want to discretize your space, which is non-trivial, but you basically you pick your resolution beforehand and then do your search. And then given that resolution, you might find an answer, but if the resolution was too coarse in any one of your dimensions, you have to refine and do it again. And here, we don't have that problem of having to refine. We just keep sampling, and we don't have to start all over again. Um, so this, what I just presented, is basically a way to get um, feasible solutions. Uh, in many cases, we actually do care about optimality, and we like to find a, something that is close to optimal. And optimal can have different meanings. Usually, people assume shortest path. Whether that's useful, it's debatable, because shortest path in joint angle space doesn't always mean shortest path. Well, usually doesn't mean shortest path in, in, in workspace by any normal measure like sweat volume or end effector displacement. But uh, yeah, you, you can come up with your notion of optimality and, and optimize with respect to that. Uh, there's two ways to achieve optimality. Uh, the simple way that people have used for a long time is, is local optimality. That we compute a feasible path first and afterwards we just perturb the trajectory. We can do some sort of shortcutting where we just sort of see if there's a straight line that connects different points along the trajectory to see if this, we can cut out some part of the trajectory. Or we can use some other kind of optimization approach where we just iteratively move the trajectory points around until we settle on the local minimum. Uh, that's typically very, uh, very fast, and for the longest time people were uh, satisfied with that. Like it seems good enough, like it was fast, and basically people focus on the harder problem of finding a feasible solution. In, in high dimensional space, that really is the harder problem of finding any solution at all, and then locally refining it was, you know, it's like, oh, an afterthought. We, you know, we have our bag of tricks, we apply that, that works fine. Uh, eventually, um, it was shown that actually with some tweaks to the algorithm uh, that seemed small, and to prove that that was optimal is really hard, actually, you can get global optimization as well. So when we construct our tree that I showed before, uh, every once in a while we need to connect uh, rewire our trees or rewire like certain subtrees are connected to another part of the tree and maybe uh, do some extra bookkeeping. Uh, so there's relatively small adjustments but huge proofs to prove that it's like I think the original paper from uh, Sertaj Karaman and Frazoli was like 80 pages and something like this that slight changes to a very basic algorithm resulted in optimality. Uh, but that's 
that can be proven that this actually results to optimal. It can also be proven that the original process guarantees to be not optimal. So not just that, you know, the details do matter. Um, so that's uh, to the basics of sampling-based motion planning. Now I want to uh, move on to sort of constraint motion planning where uh, it seems like none of what I just talked about is going to work. So in practice, uh, you know, there's lots of task constraints whenever you're trying to do things with manipulators, uh, things like keep a cup level or uh, following some sequence of weld patterns or sanding a surface or doing bimanual manipulation where we're holding things with two hands at a time. Uh, we're losing degrees of freedom because of the task. And we have our, you know, the, the degrees of freedom on a mechanism, but the task is sort of removing some of them. We cannot independently change each uh, degree of freedom. So what that means is that if we randomly sample configurations, the probability that our sampled configuration is, is valid, is basically holds the cup level or is on the surface while sanding, is zero. Right? So sampling seems like, okay, we're, we've lost everything. We can't do anything anymore. It's not entirely true. Um, so let's look at a more um, illustrative example of what constraint planning really means. So here we have a three degree of freedom planar linkage. So we have a three dimensional configuration space. And let's say we want to find a path between these two configurations. Uh, but we force the, the path to lie on a curve. We just want our arm to move along the arc of the curve. And what that means in configuration space is that now we have a reduced uh, configuration space. So instead of a three-dimensional space, now we have a two-dimensional space. We remove one degree of freedom with this constraint, and we have to move along on this surface. So one possible path might look like this. It's tracing out a curve on this circle, and it's also tracing out a corresponding curve on the surface. So that's effectively what we're doing with uh, constraint motion planning. We have a, the constraints uh, introduce this uh, lower dimensional manifold embedded in a high dimensional space. The high dimensional space is the original configuration space, but effectively we're planning on this surface. Um, so lots of people have thought about how we can deal with this. Uh, usually people have augmented existing sampling-based planners in various ways with sort of additional bookkeeping to make sure that the samples land on this manifold. So towards the less complex side of dealing with constraints is constraint relaxation. Essentially just pretend that we don't exactly or have to be on this lower dimensional manifold. Let's just inflate it a little bit. And now we have a non-zero uh, measure volume that we can sample from, right? So we still can sample and pre pretend that everything that's not inside this inflated manifold is, is in collision. Everything that's inside that manifold that's now been inflated a little bit is valid. That's the simplest trick. Basically, just don't deal with it at all. Just fudge it a little bit. Uh, then you can use things like projection, where we use some, something like uh, we have an imp implicit constraint function. We use kind of Newton's method that if you're off the manifold, we minimize until we are on the manifold. And then there are fancier tricks where we're actually building an atlas. So we're constructing tangent spaces to our manifold and keeping track of that. And you know, as we walk along the tangent space, we keep track until we fall off sort of the tangent space and recompute the tangent space and, and keep going. So there's lots of uh, bookkeeping over here, uh, but in some cases it, uh, it actually is worth it uh, compared to the, the simpler techniques. Um, and of course, if you can just reparameterize, re instead of having this implicit manifold, have an explicit manifold that you can directly sample, then that's probably the better way to go. But in many cases, you cannot solve for that explicit manifold. But uh, roughly speaking, these uh, approaches uh, would treat the problem like, like, like this. So we have our configuration space where we grow a tree with a planner, and now with configuration, uh, constraint motion planning, we have some special planner that has been modified to only sample things that are inside this manifold uh, and still uh, from this configuration space Q. And it turns out that this may not be the best way to think about it because it kind of limited the way people were thinking about which planners we could augment and there was all kinds of sort of uh, inelegant solutions that were required. Some, uh, you know, it didn't have the separation of concerns because there's one way to sort of do this high level reasoning about where to search next is exploration, exploitation bias that you always have to, or uh, trade off that you have to deal with in any kind of search and planning. You have to figure out what's the most promising way towards the goal and where should we 
search next to make sure, ensure completeness. And that seems completely separate from how should I sample constrained configurations. So what we realized is that it's much better to kind of create an abstraction that we sample over implicit spaces. So we have our uh, set of uh, x where of all the configurations where f of q equals zero. And this is now part of this space. So we really are have a plan that operates over this new kind of space. And all it knows is that this space supports interpolation and it supports sampling. And it has a notion of distance. It's not Euclidean distance. And it's not you know, standard linear interpolation. But the planet doesn't care, or shouldn't care. And now we've, if we've decoupled these things, we can choose them independently. We can play with our heuristics for how to ex search high dimensional spaces independently from how we deal with these constraints. Um, so yeah, we need to augment the space and not the planner to deal with the constraints. Um, now that we've decoupled these things, uh, we wanted to go back to these original papers and say, oh, can we really mix and match any of these previous techniques that were tied to a planner and, and show that it really isn't tied to the planner and show that you can really throw any planner at it and use projection with any planner you want and still ensure that you have completeness and optimality. But previously, these proofs were like specific for, to that combination of planner and constraint satisfaction. So if you decouple it, like, well, who knows? Like, is it still true that we have completeness and optimality if we somehow use projection or tangent space methods for, for, uh, for a new planner? And you can show that, yes, this is still true. Like it's, so projection, the, the simple idea is that you, know, you do a, when you interpolate from A to B, you take a small step from A towards B, and then you use something like Newton's method to you know, take that f of q constraint function and sort of follow the gradient of that until you're back at zero and then repeat. And, and then that way you can kind of walk along a manifold. And tangent spaces, you, know, you clearly construct tangent spaces and you keep walking along that tangent space until the error is too large and then you recompute a tangent space, like reprojection, and keep going that way. Those are two simple techniques and they, they can, can be combined with almost any planner and you can still show that uh, you didn't lose anything. You can still show that you have completeness with the right planner. You can still show you have optimality. Um, this you know, some technical details on uh, showing that each point is sampled with non-zero probability. The simplest way to see that is that, let's say you have a, a torus as your constraint surface, as the hole in the surface embedded in 3D. As that hole in the middle gets smaller and smaller and the embedded space gets larger and larger, the probability of sampling in the middle goes to zero, right? Especially if that hole kind of shrinks up. So that if the path requires you to go through that hole, then basically you're out of luck. So you kind of have to make some assumptions that when you're projecting onto that manifold, this constraint manifold, it needs to be, you know, every point needs to have some non-zero probability of being projected onto that surface. But under those sort of, you know, mild assumptions, you can show that these properties still hold. Uh, so what does that buy us? Um, well, now that we can choose independently, we can take some unusual combination of planner and constraint uh, combination. In this case, we take KPs, which is kind of an involved planner. Normally, you wouldn't think of, it's already like doing a lot of algorithmic work. You wouldn't think of, let's add something you know, complex to an already really complex algorithm. But in this case, now that we decoupled it, it doesn't matter. And it turns out that this mechanism, which is kind of a, you know, a toy example, it's, uh, it's using these, uh, this, these linkages with spherical joints and modeling it with these points with distance constraints. And these points are all attached to these disks. And you know, of course, that's how we get to lots of degrees of freedom, lots of constraints, uh, you know, significant planning time, but not terrible given the, the high number of degrees of freedom. Uh, but if you use some ver version of RRT, which is what most previous work used to augment this with constraints, you couldn't solve it at all. Right? It's, it, it, some of these heuristics do matter a lot for, for certain constraints. And this is not to basically say that RRT is a bad planner. It, it works really well in many cases. But for this particular instance, it was you know, not a good, good fit. Uh, of course, you may not care about that particular toy example. It's just a, sort of an example to show that uh, things get, can get really bad, or it's unsolvable one way and, and really fast another way. Uh, what we do care about is examples like this. We were working with NASA uh, Johnson Space Center on 
trying to climb across handrails. And this seems like, oh, a nice open environment. There are hardly any obstacles. How hard can it be? Uh, but again, there are lots of constraints because we basically have to keep this torso upright for <laughs> not very technical reasons. I mean, there's no up in space that so we can walk on the, on, the, on the ceiling, but NASA really doesn't like it. <laughs> they really want their robots to walk on one side. And, uh, and also just do experiments on Earth. You know, we have a gravity, there's a gravity offload mechanism, uh, but it only works in one direction. It doesn't it compensates for force, not for torque. So we have to keep the body upright. We have the legs attached to these handrails. And the robot is really tall. You can't, it's hard to see, but this, this, it cannot stand straight up. So it, it has actually a very limited space and it needs to do these really weird uh, Spider-Man, spider-like motions to, to walk across handrails, even though it doesn't seem like the environment is very cluttered. And of course, you know, the, the NASA people try to just use, use pure IK to say, well, why do you need planning at all? Just take two feasible IK solutions and use some version of you know, uh, IK-based techniques to just go from one post to another, do some sort of interpolation. It doesn't work. You should say what IK means. Oh, sorry, inverse kinematics. Yeah, sorry, thank you. Uh, yeah, so there's simpler techniques that you can imagine being useful in something without too much clutter. That you think, oh, you know, we use the inverse kinematics of the of the, the system to sort of move around locally, and surely that will get us across handrail from one handrail to the next. Doesn't work. There's too many local minima. You reach too many joint limits. Uh, there's all kinds of reasons that it just doesn't work. So you really do need planning, and this robot has 30 some degrees of freedom. Uh, you don't plan for all of them at the same time. Typically, you plan only for the legs or only for the arms. But uh, the example video here showed that, I showed this before, but now we have some context for appreciating the difficulty when we're, for instance, opening this door. Uh, let's see how do I, oops. Uh, so when it's opening, uh, so it, it steps from handle to handrail, eventually it turns the valve. When it slides open this door, it's, it's having, it has two feet attached to the handrail and it needs to move its body, right? So they have these closed chains that you know, really reduce the, the degrees of freedom and move this, its, its hand. So, so we're planning for, like at each step, we're planning for different numbers of degrees of freedom. But the highest number is 21. When we're move, opening this door, when we're really are planning for 21 joints and we have lots of constraints and it still takes only a few, a couple seconds, which compared to execution time is nothing, right? So you see this is sped up heavily so execution time is now the dominant factor, not planning time. All right. Um, now I wanted to talk about something really practical, and I think it's uh, maybe also important lessons here to be learned for uh, really anybody who's doing algorithmic or robotics on, on sort of how to do a fair comparison and how to do reproducible research. Uh, so now that we decoupled constraint satisfaction from planners, we have an even larger combination of things to try. And even if, if you forget about constraints, there's lots of motion planning algorithms. And if you have ideas for a new, better way of doing planning, uh, how do you show it's better? Like, what do you compare against? Right? And in, in practice, you know, people may not care about what's generally the most sophisticated algorithm. They want whatever works best for their robot doing their tasks. Uh, and you know, questions are like, what should I compare against, or which one should I use? How do I tune performance? You know, there's lots of sort of magic constants in, in these algorithms that may be hard to tune, and you know, the typical person wouldn't know how to tune. Even the authors themselves may just accidentally, just to trial and error, arrive at something that seems to work okay, and may be far from optimal. And, and even the notion of optimality is not so clear. Like, what does is, what is optimal even mean? It's just, Fastest planning time, fastest execution, some combination of both, or you know something else entirely. Uh, just to give some more data on how this, why, why this is so bad. Uh, so we, uh, I've been leading this development for the Open Motion Planning Library. Uh, it's a commonly used library. It's used inside MoveIt. In this case, uh, you use ROS for, for motion planning. It's also used inside Copelia Sim. It used to be called uh, VREP. Uh, it has lots of different algorithms. And it's been around for more than 10 years. And if you use it today, uh, with MoveIt, for instance, uh, the default algorithm that it uses is RT Connect. There's an algorithm from 2001, Steve Laval and James Kovner. Uh, it's 
really simple. It's essentially, it's this bidirectional tree idea. Um, and it has maybe one parameter that typically you don't have to tune. There's a sort of auto-tune in, in OMPL that will select some reasonable default for the particular configuration space that you have, and it seemed to work pretty well. So no tuning, works reasonably well, and people say, okay, great, I'll just use that. Uh, because if you use anything else, performance will likely be much worse. So that's, that's kind of like, that's not great, right? If, 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 for as a motion planning research, it's like, oh, I don't want people to use this algorithm from 2001, I mean, I have nothing against Steve Lebowski and James <laughs> Kovner. I mean, that's a great algorithm. But hopefully, they've made some progress since then that we can show, like, hey, you can really get much better performance if you use, you know, this algorithm from last year or this year. Um, so, yeah, there's lots of algorithms. And there are many parameters for each algorithm. Like, you know, there's Boolean things where the certain flags are enabled, integer values, real values certain dependencies between them that may not be very particularly well documented. Of course, that's you know, partly on me, but you know, there's some interactions between these parameters that cannot be chosen entirely independently. And since we're doing random sampling, just one run won't tell you the whole story. Right? You really need to look at the whole distribution. So this shows solve time, like how fast we solve this problem for a handful of selected planners. And you know, it shows these uh, box plots, so sort of a uh, into quartal ranges, like, so this is gives you a confident, 50 percent confidence interval for typical performance for solve time. But you know, you see that the distribution can vary wildly. And which one is better? Well, this one is probably better in this case, but you know, it's there's still a fair bit of overlap between these distributions. And this is also very much problem dependent. Your problem may look nothing like this. It will likely not, not look like this. So basing your selection on this problem is probably a bad idea. Right, so there's really no universal best algorithm, and it's impossible to do this with brute force. Right, so that's, that's the key problem. So one solution around this is hyperparameter optimization. Uh, we see this more and more in, in the deep learning community as well, that there's, again, all kinds of neural network architectures with all kinds of magic constants that affect performance a lot. And typically, you see results reported for you know, the, the configuration that worked. But you know, somewhere in a footnote, you see, oh, actually, we did this search for you know, who knows how many compute years to find a reasonable architecture that, that worked. Um, so th it's, it's a big problem in, in uh, machine learning and uh, reinforcement learning. So we have some sort of search space for all our hyperparameters. And we have some representative, uh, representative motion blank problems that we'll use. Um, and then we have to characterize the thing that we care about with some loss function. So some indicator of performance. And this actually turns out to be the hard part. I mean, the fact is like, hey, using hyperparameter optimization is the solution. This is not exactly the solution, because we still need to have some way to uh, quickly assess performance uh, that may not involve solving problems completely. So we need to be able to get some lost estimate with, within some time budget, whether we solve the problem or not. And it's also more important that these loss functions are more accurate for things that perform well. There will be lots of configurations that if you choose random parameters for them, they'll perform terribly. And it's, you know, it's important that we can discriminate somewhat between terrible and truly terrible, but we care more about discriminative power between things that are good and very good. Right? So here's a, a proposed loss function that, that seemed to work pretty well, that captures the sort of conventional, wis conventional wisdom about what we should optimize for. Most people care more about planning speeds. Just find plans as fast as possible, and then afterwards, with a little bit of post-processing time, you can optimize and get things that are locally optimal. So given some time budget, we can take a, one of our problem instances and solve it as many times as possible. And we solve it, let's say, m times. And this is the S1 through Sm is our series of solve times. And we can define our loss value as a quantile of S. So we take the 50% quantile and say, OK, this is the median. And but let's, medium may not always be the best choice. There's many practical cases where you also want some bound on the variability. We want a predictable behavior, right? So maybe we want something that captures some of the variance as well. So that may be an argument of using a higher quantile. If you take you know, 70 or 80% quantile, then we basically capture some of that tail and say, okay, we want something that at, in the worst case doesn't perform much worse than this. And of course, you could say, well, I want the 99% quantile, but that estimating that reliably is really, really hard. So something in between median and 99 is, is usually a good trade-off between 
estimating something that captures variance, but it's not too hard to estimate. Um, can someone think of a reason why you want a lower uh, quantile? Let's say the 30% quantile, 20% quantile. And there are reasons to do that too. Sorry, rerun? Restarts. Restarts? Yeah, it actually, it's, it's most useful when you run multiple instances of the same planner in parallel. Essentially, you terminate whatever, whatever, whenever one of the planners wins. Actually, you have this random behavior, right? You have this distribution of outcomes. Essentially, you have all these different slot machines that you can pull in parallel, and it's only one of them has to be a winner. And so the variability can be large. So then it makes sense to solve for something that has maybe a lot of variability, but still a low median, right? So a lower quantile actually can give you a benefit. And you can show with this kind of parallel running of independent, independent runs of algorithms, you can get nonlinear speed ups. This is a like, well-known property of a lot of randomized algorithms that uh, have this property. Um, so it, it's possible that within some time budget t, uh, we find no solutions. In that case, s is the set s of solved times is empty. Uh, in that case, we can define sol the loss value as t plus you know, square distance to goal. So even if you solve nothing at all, we get some number that kind of captures how close did we get. And this loss value is always guaranteed to be higher than this quantile of s, right? Since we basically start from value t. So discriminate, discriminate between the ones that solve it and the ones that don't solve it. And between the ones that so don't solve it, we have some way to gauge which ones are better. Right, so we definitely always use at most time t to uh, evaluate this. We are more accurate the more values we have, so that checks that box. And it's somewhat discriminative between terrible and not so terrible configurations. So this seems like it checks all the boxes of what makes for a good loss function. Uh, of course, this is just one possible definition. Now that if you have this sort of general hyperparameter optimization framework, we can throw in anything else that we can now easily formulate. So we can say, well, we want some combination of planning time and execution time. We want short paths that are also take short time to compute or we want to optimize the convergence rate. So there's all these planners that essentially never terminate, have maybe sort of any time properties that we can return a solution. And I care that this curve of like length of the path goes to, zero, like goes to the optimal path as fast as possible. Uh, so we can come up with loss functions for that too. Uh, I won't present results for those two things, but um, uh, I'll show some results for optimizing planning time. Um, so there are a lot of existing frameworks out there. We use one of them called uh, uh, BOHB, which stands for Bayesian Optimization combined with Hyperband. And the general idea is that we optimize in a uh, series of uh, optimizations, a series of, uh, of sampling different configurations. So we sample a bunch of different parameters for planners, planner configurations. And uh, each time, so in, 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 in initial rounds, we have spent very little time, kind of basically a coarse sampling of the entire hyperparameter search space and have a very coarse estimate for our loss values. And the most promising ones are kept and then basically we sample some more around that in, in subsequent round with, with more time. And in pure hyperband, we basically just keep random sampling. But with, when combined with Bayesian optimization, we basically during each round, we sort of refine the Bayesian model of what looks like the most promising part in the search space. So based on the loss values, we build some belief about, oh, this looks like the right part of the parameter space to be searching in and then we sample some more over there with some bias. And we still keep sampling everywhere with some probability. Uh, and this is showing some results from a, you know, a, a reinforcement learning problem with carpool swing up, typical kind of reinforcement learning task. And it shows like, oh yeah, this, this combination of uh, Bayesian optimization and hyperband works really well. So that seemed really promising as a, as a tool that we wanted to use, so we basically fit this problem formulation inside this framework and it, uh, it worked really well. And, and how did we know this? Uh, so we tried two different robots in five different environments, so picking things from inside a box, in, from a shelf, and tabletop, and you know, different kind of shelf arrangements. Um, and then we basically did a lot of sort of randomization, lots of variants of each problem. This is just showing one thing, but we sort of moved these different cylinders around on, on side the sh inside the shelves to create different uh, you know, configuration spaces, and, or sorry, um, uh, yeah, different spaces to send, plan around in. And um, we did different, a number of different experiments where we basically take different instances from the same class and see how they generalize across classes, or take different 
problem instances from each class to get basically a more diverse experience to train on and compare that against a baseline, so like the default planner, which is in this case RT Connect if you use Move It, and characterize some notion of generalization. And also try to uh, generalize across representations, which may be not a completely obvious uh, thing to think of, but this is something that happens a lot in practice. That we, it's nice to have this model of the world and plan it, it's nice and clean. In practice, we often have you know, just depth images, at point clouds, and Octomap as our environment representation, which is the sort of uh, voxel-like re representation. It would be nice if a plan that was optimal for this kind of mesh representation would also be fairly optimal for something that is you know, the Octomap version of this. It's like it's not guaranteed, maybe it's terrible, maybe it doesn't translate at all. Uh, luckily, there's some good news. There's a lot of numbers in this, in this table and I won't try to explain all of it, but let's take at the simple, ex the simple example first, this box row. So we started with the baseline of 0.15 seconds to solve this. Actually, this is the loss value, but in this case, it is also the, the solve time. Uh, and you know, when it's optimized, it's 50% uh, faster, a little bit faster. With a, you know, RT Connect still and does it a little bit faster. Um, and performance is somewhat similar on other problems of the same kind. So picking things from a box from slightly different configurations and slightly different arrangement of cans inside that box is about the same. Uh, and then when solving these, the same uh, uh, configuration, using the same configuration for other classes, it's terrible. It doesn't, doesn't scale very well. It's, all these other problems are actually harder. It's not that it's, it doesn't generalize, it's just these problems are by default already harder, but you can sort of look at the baseline and see like, yeah, all these problems are harder. But what's interesting is that we can actually get pretty good performance across the board. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, with, uh, with this last row, where we say, okay, take three instances from three different examples, the box, the shelf, and the table environment, and uh, now we see really much bigger in for, uh, you know, order of magnitude the difference between baseline and optimized. And on top of that, we get good generalization. Right? And also, actually, uh, I didn't show anything, but good generalization across uh, representations. So the Octomap representation is a little bit slower because it's geometrically more complex, but nowhere near as bad as this baseline representation. Right? So this, as a tool, this is a, just an incredibly practical problem. I mean, the, the contribution really here is in trying to come up with a good uh, loss formulation that gives you meaningful information. But this, um, yeah, this is a reasonable way to find uh, a well-performing planner configuration. Uh, with one caveat, if the, the initial representative problem that you picked is really hard, then optimization may not converge at all. So you see the baseline was struggling, but uh, in the optimized case, basically we were timing out and whatever it came up with, was, was terrible, it didn't perform very well at all. Uh, so it, it's, it's, it seems like this is ripe for some sort of curriculum learning, right? Where you basically start with easier problems and optimize that, and then uh, maybe uh, hopefully generalize the more complex versions and maybe you have to retrain uh, a little bit more on that more complex problem. But yeah, uh, we are planning to make this open source and hopefully make it a useful tool for the community so that anybody who's doing motion planning research doesn't have to make some educated guess about what's going on and which plan to use, and that you do a more informed uh, you know, establishment of baseline perfor performance. Uh, and luckily this generalizes very broadly, um, but one of the things that we're still kind of wondering about is like how much of it is kinematics dependent? Is it basically just once you've optimized for one robot, is that good for all problems, or does it, can we somehow, some, you know, does it still depend a little bit on the problem uh, specifics? And I already mentioned curriculum learning as a way to sort of bootstrap the, the learning and say, okay, we start with simple problems, optimize the configuration, and then use that to refine on more complex things. And I already mentioned a little bit about this running up multiple instances of an algorithm in parallel. Just kind of have a, and we can, instead of having instances of the same algorithm, we can use this to use different algorithms, have a sort of competitive portfolio that sort of hedges against all adversarial scenarios. Like you, you don't optimize for one problem, you have sort of a bag of tricks and you run all these algorithms in parallel and surely one of them will be sort of successful against the particular environment if you engineered. And so this may be a way that we can find a way to uh, competitive portfolios. All right. Uh, so that's uh, all I wanted to say about planning. Uh, now I wanted to sort of 
go back to that earlier example where I showed this robot doing things in, inside the space station and figure out how we can use this now to move towards more autonomy. Um, so the, um, I think everybody who's spent significant time with real robots will realize that there's a lot of things that it's, it's to make 100% autonomous and have it work all the time in, in the field, you know, not in, in a lab setting, but making something really reliable that you can just hand it off to a non-robotic system. Like here, this robot performs this task 100% reliable. You know, like autonomous cars, you know, there's often still a call center, like for the rare exception that a human driver or a remote driver can intervene and take over. You know, robot vacuum cleaners, you know, mostly <laughs> no human in a loop, but for anything more complex, <laughs> we'll still need a human. So here is, uh, and how much human involvement uh, you need depends a lot, right? On, on uh, this level of autonomy is really a spectrum and like how much autonomy you want depends on lots of things like uncertainty, right? And actuation, perception, modeling, risk rewards. So here, this is a explosive ordnance disposal robot, you know, <laughs> high risk reward if the clock is ticking, Maybe you want to take more risk if the clock is not ticking. You definitely want to take your time and maybe have a little bit more human involvement and not just press autopilot. Um, here's a, a picture of a DRC challenge. You know, this, you know, this is supposed to model the uh, Fukushima nuclear disaster where you really can't put people in there, need robots in there, uh, but there's you know, basically bad communication. So maybe joysticking robots is just not an option. You need some autonomy. You need to get some useful work done. What's the best way to script tasks and uh, you know rely on planning and con good control policies and good perception? But uh, and and then the right is the sort of example that's sort of most clean, where you have a data center where you know, um, a lot of companies don't want com people in data centers anymore because that's contaminating things and it would be much nicer to have robots just swap out computers, hard drives, and cables. And, uh, they're all known objects. Uh, things can still go wrong every once in a while, but it seems more amenable to uh, almost fully autonomous. Right? Where we can have some minimal uh, level of uh, the human supervision, but it's, it's, it's possible that uh, we can have one person control 100 robots in, a data, in lots of data centers around the world. So, so on the spectrum of full autonomy, so we have like full manual teleoperation, which is not entirely satisfactory, right? It's, it works for some ca cases. And actually, in, in, in explosive ordnance disposal, the people who are trained for that get really excited that they have these game controllers. They plan in joint space, which is the worst. You know, they're controlling individual joints, and they get a kick out of being really good at it. And if you tell them, hey, there's an easier way, just press this button, and it will just you know, move towards the bomb. And like, no, they don't want that. They don't, they don't, tr they don't trust it. So there's, there's also. <laughs> A human element in, in there, like how do we get people to trust robots and how do you get them to sort of see that there is a better way and um, that's a whole other, other side to the story. Um, just to demonstrating that it's possible to do this reliable with, with minimal user inputs is, is a hard challenge. But we can ident definitely identify small units of work that, that seem like, okay, they're, we can kind of think of them as canned behavior, even though they're not quite canned, right? If I approach a door with a, ro a mobile robot with an arm, each time it's going to be standing somewhat differently and the handles may be slightly differently oriented and the, the doors are mostly standard but not quite standard. So the motion has to be adapted each time. So there's definitely room for planning. But once I've identified important parameters, where the hinge is, where the handle is, where I stand relative to these things, I can fill in the rest, right, the, the motion planning. So we only need the human to kind of verify that I identify the critical parameters right. Like where's the door handle, where's the hinge, where do I stand in the world? And then everything else can be left, over, left to planning and control. So that's, that's the part that we're working on. Where we, uh, this is, uh, I'll show you a video in a moment where we're basically showing how you can open doors or open doors with a robot that's sort of minimal inputs. Um, and these are sort of re reusable building blocks, right? Some parameters that are user provided or verified. And you know, we can have some several motion planning problems along the way. Even for something as simple as open a drawer, maybe you have a free space motion to kind of approach, then kind of a Cartesian motion, maybe sort of approach the handle and close the gripper and then pull out in a certain way. That already is like even something that simple is already decomposed in sort of several motion blank problems. And then we have some possible backup behaviors, like things can go wrong. Maybe the drawer jams and I have a backup behavior or 
I may try to pick up an object a few times before I decide, okay, I, I need a better way to you know, do grass post detection. Uh, so there's already there, there's, in this basic task, there's just enough complexity that it's not just one motion plan problem, there's policies involved and control, controllers uh, involved. Uh, next step that uh, we want to get to then is uh, objectives. Basically now we have these basic building blocks, we piece them together into bigger tasks. Uh, so, you know, this is uh, a, a wireframe uh, design, so this is not, not real just yet, but the idea is like, let's say we want to walk inside the space station, uh, we basically just select at a basic level, just like, oh, which foot we want to move next, and once we decide that we are walking, within that context, all we care about is where handrails are. If we just select a handrail, not a particular position on the handrail, we don't care. We just say, move to this handrail, and it will solve the rest. Because it may be that this particular exact position is unreachable or un undesirable for whatever reason. So we leave the planner enough freedom to sort of figure out the rest. We just say only the symbolic high-level bit, like it needs to move to this handrail, but where exactly we'll leave that up to the planner. And once we have done, done that, we can basically piece these blocks together. This is sort of a, a timeline where we have different tasks with different subtasks, and we can specify along the way, like, oh, at this point, let's insert a breakpoint I want to manually inspect, where we have some event-driven thing that will basically call a human operator. Say, oh, at this point, we need to definitely check everything are, are still on track. And as we move through this timeline, we can show a visualization of like, a canonical rollout of the policy that we've computed. But uh, of course, uh, during actual execution, we'll see the actual video of actual execution. Um, a lot of this is still sort of in the pipeline. This is kind of where we're headed uh, to give you a, a little bit of a flavor where we are right now. Um, this is sort of a, a little setup that we have in our, in our office with a UR5. We have you know, a little cabinet where we can do door opening and uh, drawer opening. So here we, we mark the handle in the hinge of course, in the future, we hope that you know, perception will just kind of suggest like, oh, it looks like the hinges over here. And then uh, we can have this constraint motion that it will not rip the door off the hinges and open a door. Um, and then uh, there's different ways to do uh, inspections. So we kind of have, um, you know, we can basically specify a certain distance that we say, oh, I want to get this close to the object. And we can do a lot of these things in the image plane. It does the correspondence between image plane and the actual 3D world. Uh, so it's makes a lot of things easier. So the interface is, looks sort of really simple, and it's, of course, by design. And we have these like, presets at the top for sort of situational awareness, like a flash there for a second, where you can say, rather than having to drive the camera around to figure out what the world looks like, we just say, look from the left, look from the right, look behind. Rather, so you kind of take away that part of reasoning about the kinematics and trying to avoid singularities and joint limits. It's like, that's it's much easier to leave that to planning. Right? It's like, it's, it's definitely possible to give you manual control. And we can and we do that in some cases, but for most, for things like situational awareness, it's just so much easier to just say, look from a few canonical viewpoints and give you that kind of perspective. And at the bottom, it shows you kind of a, a linear, linearization of the, the policy, right? It's like, oh, it's, it goes to these different states, but under the hood, there's, you know, more complex policy that actually is more like a graph. Um, but yeah, uh, ideally in the future, like when I would have the basic building box, you can say, fetch me uh, a screwdriver from the filing cabinet and it will just be able to go through sequentially through you know, the, the drawers in some order until it finds the screwdriver and get it back to you. Right? So that's, uh, this is just showing like basic building blocks. Next is just building on top of that. This is showing you just like low level capabilities. Like yes, we can still join control because in the real world, many customers still want it, like the EOD guys, the explosive ordnance disposal guys, still want to be able to, when needed, to go to joint control or have really fine end effect control. Um, and this is uh, right now shown in a, a QT app, but we have a partnership with Formance, which is maybe a company some of you have heard of. It's a cloud robotics company. Uh, now you can just log into your browser, and sort of once you log into the browser, select the robot you want to control, select the particular re release of the software for that robot and that you care about. Because now we're, you know, everybody has their own version of the software and you can sort of remotely uh, control robots. And it's, yeah, really fun to, to play around with. So we, so we are a remote friendly company. A lot of our developers are elsewhere in the world, but they can still test on real hardware uh, with uh, just a simple web interface. Um, yeah, so a few takeaways from this uh, presentation. Um, 
One is about randomness in planning. Uh, I think uh, a lot of people, when they think of sampling-based planning, still, you know, the stereotypical image is like, this is how your robot moves with sampling-based planning. That doesn't have to be that bad. Uh, careful tuning will help a lot. Uh, with randomness, you can still have completeness, optimality. You can have soft constraints, cost functions, and hard constraints. Uh, separating out these concerns is important. So you can really basically accurately optimize for the thing that you care about. Um, and this tuning can solve a lot of the sort of awkwardness that you see in, in sort, of, uh, sort of atypical behavior. In my opinion, then you can actually get high quality motions uh, with a little bit of tuning work. Uh, and this motion planning is basically, a, a, I think, an important building block for supervised autonomy. All right, uh, I see them over time. Sorry about that. Uh, real quickly, a lot of people at Picnic contributed to this. A lot of the, the work on motion planning was uh, done in collaboration with uh, Rice University, where I spent a lot of time with Lydia Kavraki and uh, Zeki Kingston and Konstantinos Hamzas. And uh, a lot of the work with NASA was done with uh, Julia Badger, Jonathan Rogers, and Philip Strahr. All right, thanks. Yes. Uh, you mentioned actuator uncertainty. Mm -hmm. uh, what is, how do you currently handle planners where the system didn't actuate the plan given to it? Is there an interface? Do you build that into, I can't do this control. I thought I could. I can't. So is that built back into the planner, or is that a decoupled problem? You just some middle layer handles the control to planner integration. Um. Yeah, there's different ways to deal with this. Uh, one is to, um, yeah, basically don't do planning in certain cases and use visual servoing. Um, that's definitely one solution, and that's definitely built into this uh, um, supervised autonomy software that we have that as a capability. It's like, hey, in some cases, there's too much uncertainty. We just don't know where everything is. In other cases, having a robust controller or just, for instance, when you're doing some sort of insertion task, insert past where you think you need to go just until you basically hit some force limit, right? So it's like, don't close, basically keep going, cl keep closing the door even beyond where you think it's closed so that you're really, really sure it's closed because you don't know exactly how far you've moved. Things like that can, can help. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, so for, for things like polishing and sending, where you're tracing out something on the surface with force constraints, uh, you could plan a, uh, a, sort of a global path first to say roughly this covers the entire sur a coverage plan. But then you feed that to a trajectory generator that will say, I'm going to execute this, but subject to this force constraint. So during execution, like epsilon position error is terrible because basically it means the difference between sending and not sending. You really need to make sure that the force constraint is satisfied. Right? So you, you, you're basically shifting the priority then in, uh, towards staying close to the force constraints. So you just have a, a controller that takes that path as a reference path that is free to deform it subject to that force constraint. Yeah. Yes. Oh, was there a question in the back? I didn't Yeah. Uh, for the longest time, sampling configurations was seen as uh, like a uh, atomic operation that was inherently a part of the planner. When really uh, you can think of where to sample and how to sample as two different operations. And basically, what we're doing is we're changing how to sample. We just basically abstract that away to say there's some way to randomly sample. Maybe it's uniform, maybe it's close to uniform. We don't know for sure, but we're doing our best to sort of randomly sample everywhere. Uh, and that's now pushed into this uh, implicit space. We don't have, the planner has no control over that part. It's just give me a random sample. Uh, but it can use, still say sample somewhere near this other configuration. And, and that's where uh, you know some of the heuristics come in on where where to sample next. So it controls the uh, 
uh, exploration exploitation trade off and says okay I want to uh, this seems this state seems like it's close to the goal let's sample around some more until I get to the goal versus let's sample to some part of the space where I have no samples and so you can there's different ways to do uh, bookkeeping and how much coverage you have in the space but that's that's what the planner should decide on how much it should expand everywhere versus greedily moving towards the goal but it shouldn't decide on just the basic operation of randomly sampling itself as we push that into the in the state space abstraction then we can sort of solve these things separately so uh, a question regarding the hyperplan project mm -hmm. For sure. If yes, like how much are we losing out on by not orchestrating the structural environment? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, and to be honest, uh, it's, it's hard to say because like how many different robots and how many different sort of motion plane problems do you need to decide that? It's, it's hard to say if I, I mean, I showed results for five different environments, two different robots. They could say something uh, about it, but it's it doesn't co cover the full range of kinematics or geometric complexity of real life scenes, right? It, it, there's a lot more possible. I have no idea how well this translates to the results for a stretch, whose kinematics are very, very different from, uh, you know, a, a Baxter robot. But so it's, it's also, I mean, we are at a university, so it's kind of an academic pro question to ask. But in practice, most people have just the one robot or the one application they care about and then being able to just say for these kinds of applications that this robot, this is the right kind of planning configuration is already extremely valuable and they, you know, in, in real world settings, many, it, it doesn't matter as much whether it translates to a completely different robot. Especially because it's just, uh, you know, a little bit of compute that you have to do once per robot. So I'll take the last question. Yeah. So, um, you didn't mention deep learning very much. No. Uh, and so it's like past 2012, so didn't deep learning solve all of this anyway? Yes, deep learning can also solve inverse kinematics. No, it's, it's, a, it's uh, it, it, there's definitely a role to play for deep learning. I, I don't want to be dismissive of deep learning. Uh, there's lots of things that deep learning does really well. And in the context of motion planning and manipulation, I think grass post detection is uh, a perfect example where we can point a you know, really off-the-shelf RGBD camera at something and use reasonable uh, segmentation and just say, oh yeah, here's an object, how do I pick it up? It will do a reasonable job of just saying, okay, this is how I pick it up. Whereas if I had to compute a 3D model of this unknown object and do some sort of grass post computation, it's really hard. So that, that's where it works really well. There's also, I think, a lot of potential in, in reasoning about things that are impossible to estimate, like coefficients of friction. I mentioned this to, to Seth already, like right here. Trying to, like uh, doing in hand manipulation, there's lots of contacts, lots of friction, and it's, you could try to build a model for everything and try to sort of simulate what everything, well, what might happen. Uh, but that's something where you can, I think, have a deep learning. You can basically, well, we, need, we don't need to know everything exactly. And finding out the salient features is really hard to detect from all this information that we have. But that's where deep learning, I think, can extract useful information. Cool. Uh, well, let's thank Mark again.